board meeting of the Frankfurt Plant Board for Tuesday, February 16th at 5 o'clock. We're doing this as a special meeting, as a, a video conference. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Poe to call the roll. Member Hale? Here. Member Keybine? Here. Member Mason? Here. Member Snyder? Here. Member Dutton Mitchell? Here. Hey, we have a quorum. All members are present. Uh, first order of business is to conduct a public hearing regarding increasing the rate for retransmission surcharge, increasing the rate for cable network pass-through fee, and increasing the rate for bulk cable one and bulk cable two, and reducing the rate for HBO Max. And with that, I'd like uh, Vice Chairman Mason, if he would, to conduct the hearing. Okay. This hearing will come to order. My name is Steve Mason. I have been requested by the board to conduct this hearing. With me today are board members and staff of the Frankfurt Electric and Water Plant Board. We are here to receive comments regarding one, increasing rates for retrans surcharge, two, increasing rates for cable network pass-through fee, three, increasing rates for bulk cable one and bulk cable two, and four, reducing rates for HBO Max. This public hearing was advertised in accordance with the regulations for public notification and appeared in the weekend, February the 6th and 7th, 6th through the 7th, 2021 edition of the State Journal newspaper. To conduct this hearing in an organized fashion, we have asked that anyone wishing to comment register via email with Kathy Poe or Kathy Lindsay. This hearing will be conducted informally and voluntarily by the Frankfurt Electric and Water Plant Board in order to accept comments on the above item. Both oral and written comments will be accepted. Any and all persons present who wish to make a statement will be afforded an opportunity to do so. If you have a written statement to accompany your oral presentation, a copy of the written statement should be provided to the board prior to your presentation. Oral presentation should be limited to no more than three minutes. If necessary, I will interrupt and request a presentation to be com completed due to this time limit. I may ask questions of any person presenting oral comments where it is necessary to clarify the nature or substance of the comments. The board reserves the right to answer questions at a later date. It is the job of the board to fairly consider various points of view and information. We want public input and involvement and I hope you do not find our standard procedures restrictive. Additional oral comments and written comments will be accepted and considered if they are submitted no later than the end of normal business hours on Monday, March the 15th, 2021. To submit a comment, please contact FPB at 352-4372 or on our website, which is www.fpb.cc. Before we open the floor for comments, Mr. Harvey Couch will provide a summary of the details. Harvey. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mason. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder to the board and, and those folks watching at home, um, just to summarize the, uh, the rate changes that we're requesting. As always, the, the, the increases are a direct pass-through uh, of the programming costs of the networks uh, on classic cable and on our retrans uh, surcharge uh, for the first item, the retrans surcharge, uh, we're asking uh, to increase the uh, the surcharge uh, twenty two to twenty two dollars and thirty nine cents per month, effective. Um, I think it'll be May first, twenty twenty one, twenty four dollars and seventy eight cents, effective January first, twenty twenty two, and twenty seven dollars and twenty five cents, effective January first, twenty twenty three. Uh, the second item increases the rate for the cable network pass-through fee uh, from $56.71 to $59.66, uh, again, effective uh, May 1st, 2021. This fee was established last year uh, and is a direct pass-through of the monthly fees paid by FPB to uh, cable networks for the right to distribute their programming. This is a 5.2% increase. Uh, and then the uh, bulk cable one and two increases, uh, bulk cable one from $13.96 per outlet per month to $14.80 per outlet per month, uh, effective May 1st. Bulk cable one is defined in the FPB tariff is typically hotels and KSU dormitories. Um, 
uh, proposed to increase the rate for bulk cable two from $24.35 per outlet per month to $25.81 per outlet per month, effective May 1st. Bulk cable two is defined in the tariff, typically includes office complexes with more than eight outlets. Uh, these increases are at the same percentage as the cable network uh, increases. And then finally, reducing the rate for HBO Max. Um, we're proposing to reduce the rate for HBO Max from $18.50 to uh, $15 even to put it on uh, parity with other premium offerings and also the direct-to-consumer offering from HBO Max. So I think that's all I've got to share on this item. Mr. Mason? Oh, are there any comments? Did we receive any comments? No, I did not receive any comments and neither did Kathy Lindsay. Uh, Steve, if it'd be all right, Harvey, could you explain for anybody watching exactly what, who is, who, what is the retrans, who are those, who are those uh, stations, and why we're passing it through? What happens there? Sure. Um, so that uh, encompasses all of the local broadcast stations. So uh, this, the the two CBS affiliates, the two NBC affiliates, uh, the two ABC affiliates, and the one Fox affiliate that we carry uh, from Lexington and Louisville. And um, those rates are, are negotiated every three years as part of the retransmission transmission consent um, process that's established by uh, the federal government. And uh, so again, those rates are the are the exact pass through of what what the plan board pays for those uh, networks on a monthly per subscriber basis, and uh, and and the customers are that those costs are are passed directly on to the customers with no no additional costs uh, added on. So if I'm not correct, that's federal law that allows that. And even though if you took the signal out of the air, you wouldn't be charged when cable companies like us or any other cable company uh, takes those and puts them on the cable and takes them to consumers, then we have to pay for their signal, right? Correct. Yeah, the the, the broadcasters have the right to, to charge in exchange for their consent to, for us to retransmit the signals. So, yeah, like you said, they are free over the air for anybody with an antenna. Um, but when when we retransmit them to our customers, then, then we have to pay uh, or our customers have to pay uh, yeah. for the right to receive those channels. So I guess, John, if there's no other comments, we're concluding the public hearing. Right, and I guess then anybody has rights to submit what comments up, what, I think you said, Steve, what, March 15th? March the 15th, Monday. And then Monday, we'll review, then, as I understand it, then what, at our March meeting, then we'll make the final decision about rate increases, is that correct? Harvey. Yes, sir, yeah, that would be, we would ask for, for approval of the rates at the, uh, at the March meeting. Uh, they would go into effect, um, April 1st, which would essentially we bill because we bill a month ahead, it would be in effect May 1st, but bills that start to go out in April would be when it would take effect. Okay. Okay, I guess, Steve, if, if that concludes it, then we'll go on with the rest of the agenda, if that's okay with you. I'm good. Okay. Uh, next item is uh, approval of the minutes from January 19th, 2021 special board meeting. Everybody has the minutes in front of them. Uh, do we have any corrections or changes? If not, do we have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? M minutes are adopted. Next item is accept financials, and this is... Um, Mr. Denton, uh, you want to give us the update on both the financial status and where we're at in terms of past dues? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to be presenting this and also have with us Cassie Estel, one of our customer service supervisors, to uh, walk through this. Um, I know what we've gone through with COVID and, and customer service go hand in hand, so we can both here to cover it and answer any questions you may have. I'd like to start on page 27 of your board packet. Uh, talking first about the COVID-19 uh, impact to the Frankfurt Plant Board in past two balances that we've covered. Uh, on page 27, that very top chart there is a list of the past two customer accounts by number and dollar amount. 
Um, starting back when we first uh, when we went to two bill cycles in May of 17, all the way uh, representing where we are at the end of January. Um, historically, the plant board, since we went to cycle, two cycle billing, covers uh, and carries about $780,000 in past due bills uh, month to month. That's pretty standard. Whenever we get uh, to the COVID-19 impact starting in March of 2020, and we, we suspended service disconnections, uh, we did see that number to continue to increase uh, from March all the way until uh, you'll notice since the last four months, we've been hanging around the $3 million mark in total past due bills. Um, something good to report that uh, from December of 20 to January of 21, uh, there was a reduction in $226,000 in past due bills, a reduction, uh, and also a reduction in 465 accounts. Uh, so in January, we did go back to our uh, non-pay service disconnections as it related to telecom. Uh, so that was the contributing factor, I believe, into seeing some of that reductions as our customers uh, began to set up, uh, adhere to those payments arrangements that we'd set up uh, between six months and 24 months. Uh, so that's that's kind of where we were at the end of January. You'll notice uh, throughout this pandemic, the, the breakdown between our business and residential customers has been pretty steady. Looking at the second chart on page 27, about 80% of our past due balances uh, are residential accounts uh, with the remaining 20% being our business accounts. And that's been very steady over this, this time. Um, I'd like to look at page 29. We've taken the past due balance amount, which is um, just under $3 million as of the end of January, 2021 and have broken that balance into different categories. So these categories are days since the last payment was made by the customer. You'll notice between December and January, as we went back to our non-pay disconnect process, we uh, had a, uh, a lot of our past due bills started to uh, move towards the zero to 30 day category. So we had reductions in all of our other um, days since last payment categories which was, was good to see and, and as we would expect as we, uh, as we continue to get people caught up to date with their bill and, and adhering to these payment arrangements. Um, I was gonna see if, if the board has any questions for me as it relates to, to COVID-19. Uh, on the financial side, um, good news to report is that when we looked at our composition of accounts receivable as of the end of January and look at what do we believe is collectible um, we made an adjustment in the right direction. We had a reduction in $556,000, a reduction in our bad debt expense on our financial statements. So that's uh, moving in the right direction as we start to get a little bit more confidence in, in what is going to be considered collectible accounts receivable. Um, so that's good news. Hopefully we'll, we'll continue to see that, that trend uh, as we move forward into the months ahead. Um, Cassie, if, if you wouldn't mind to give the board just a little insight into how January 21 looked from a customer service standpoint at, in your department. Hi there. I hope everyone can hear me. It's the first time doing this for my phone. Can you hear me okay, David? Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening, members of the board. The customer service reports are on pages 111 to 117 of your board packet. Um, the thing I wanted to highlight probably the most is in January with us resuming disconnects for the first time in almost a year, we had over 12,000 points of contact with customers from either our CSRs, our supervisors, or our cashiers over the phone, in the lobby, or curbside rather, and then paying bills. So it was a very busy month. Um, and that shows a little bit in our increased wait times, but we would expect that with that increase in volume of customers. Um, we had been holding it less than a minute on those wait times since March of last year, but with us resuming the disconnects and then implementing people into the default payment plans and just explaining to people how those would work and what their payment expectations were, it took a little longer to get through those seven to 12,000 customers and have those detailed conversations with them. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you all might have about any other reports in the packet this month or any questions you have. Uh, Cassie, how many people um, have we had to cut off so far? Do you have that number? No, sir, I don't have that in front of me. Final numbers, we have done two cycles. We did cycle one and two, the um, 
I apologize. We've done three. We did two in January and then the first one in February so far. Um, we're averaging, I think, around 400 for each of those, Mr. Cuban, but I'm not 100% certain as I don't have that in front of me right now. If but I, I can definitely if, get that for you. If I'm, if I'm a customer and I've been cut off because I didn't pay the bill and I, I don't have, didn't make any arrangements or whatever, what would I have to do to get turned back on? Give us a call. We'll work with you. Um, the standard procedure is for a customer to pay their current charges plus a certain amount towards the arrearage. We take the arrearage and split it onto a payment plan from anywhere six months up to 24 months, typically, depending on the balance. Um, and if you're not able to pay that whole amount, that's a conversation we can have with them as well if they have a need for the service. As long as they're able to start a payment plan that would allow them to work towards that goal, we typically are able to work with them. Yeah. We have any questions for us, uh, either Cassie or David, Steve? Uh, what happens to the customer that has been cut off and we come into this kind of weather? Uh, are they automatically, and I assume we're at a, at a level that there wouldn't be a cutoff in this kind of temperature? Yes, sir. So, the only thing that's been cut off at this time, Mr. Mason, is telecom services. Okay. We don't do any electricity when temperatures are 32 or below. So at this point, no one's been impacted with regular non-pays for their electricity. Um, it's typically been telecom services of some sort. Um, One other question, John. Uh, sure, sir. Back to the uh, the past due accounts. We asked a question about the uh, the uh, residential customer. I, I'd be curious as to if we know the level of if we can classify or categorize the number in the, in the business, whether it's small business, medium business, large business, in the past due amounts, you know, the 580,000 there. Do you know what, what kind of businesses or what size of businesses that might entail? Mr. Mason, we could, uh, the, the only thing we could pull back to is the classification in, of their electric service. So we could tell if they were a commercial or a large power but we can break that down just a little bit further for you and get that to you. I, I mean, I'd just be curious. I don't know if that, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's money out there that's coming or is out there for small businesses. And if that helps highlight it, highlights whoever disseminates that money, if it is any money out there, that may be helpful to some, to, uh, you know, maybe to the city perhaps. Dawn, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I just wondered if there was still money available through Community Action and the city and county money through Roslyn to help people. And does that only help with their electric or will that help with telecom also? Typically, that only helps with electric, water, and sewer, Ms. Hale. There was a grant early in the pandemic that allowed the funds from Bluegrass to go towards telecom services. It's my understanding that that money has been exhausted and they're not taking anything right now except for their normal crisis funds is the last update we got from them in January. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for either Cassie or David? Chair, I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, commend um, the customer service representatives on on how hard they worked, especially in January. And I know the the numbers um, that you all had to deal with um, because of the the cutoffs. Um, and um, um, I have a suggestion, and I don't know if this if it can be implemented or not. But I know on the automated um, message. Um, line when a customer calls in um, um, and hopefully it, it won't keep up like this but I know there were a couple days especially in January where the volume that was going to be dealt with that day was just going to be unusually high because of the moratorium having been lifted and and other issues um, and um, so I'm wondering if maybe when you anticipate a very high volume call day, if on the message, it can sort of explain that issue. And um, I know it, I know it uh, prompts customers if they would like to leave their number to leave their number and they would be called back in the same order by the end of the day. Um, 
but maybe just to give a little explanation, um, just to prevent some frustrations. Cassie, is that something you all can add to the uh, the void when people are connected to you all to, if there's going to be a heavy volume to give that explanation that we're experiencing heavy calls and whatever due to whatever due to the current situation? We have reached out to the IT department to ask them that question, as well as also asking about inputting a message in there just to advise customers. If they choose the callback feature, they will, in fact, receive a callback that same day, regardless of whether we've closed yet or not. So IT is looking into that capability for us to see where we can place those recordings and whether we would have to do that on the front or it can be built into our Shortel phone system. But we did reach out to them after talking to Ms. Dutton Mitchell earlier in the month, and they are looking into that for us already. Okay. Would you give the board an update on what IT gets back to you and tells you if we can do that? Yes, sir. And let everybody know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Don. Does uh, uh, David? I'm sorry. John, uh, yes, sir. David, David, uh, you had a, um, I got on the phone with David earlier and asked him a couple of questions and he was very helpful kind of walking me through this. David, you mentioned the, the bad debt. Um, we had, we, uh, kind of forecasted down a little bit on our bad debt to what did you say? 550,000. Yes, sir. We re reduced it by that amount on the estimate. Where, where does that compare to a, to what our last non COVID affected year would have been? So we typically, right off around $300,000 on a normal yeah. fiscal year. This year, uh, not really knowing where we would end up, we doubled that to an, a budget estimate of $600,000 in bad debt. Okay. So um, for the year, I believe we're tracking at 400 right now. Uh, yeah. We're going the right direction. So I'm, I'm hoping we can stay below that budget number um, as we, we get through the year. And, and you mentioned in our conversation yesterday, we don't use collections because our, our, the, the, the way we get most of this money back is when someone comes back to sign up for service, we get the money back then uh, before they can start service, correct? Yes, sir. We used a, a third-party collection service for years and then and did a look at the results from that and found that by far most of our collections of bad debt were from customers returning back to FPB to restart service. Uh, and in order for them to restart service uh, with an outstanding account, they've had to get caught up to date. And that was the, the significant collections in, in the written off debt. So that's where we are today. Good. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, David, did you have anything else you wanted to add to either the, uh, the uh, COVID updates or the financials at this point? Well, just for the board, uh, we're, we're tracking uh, above uh, better than expected on our revenue side and below budgeted expenses. So we're, we're doing well as far as that's concerned. Uh, we'll have our financial statements out on our website for our customers to see at any given time. They can also go out to the Department of Local Government website under the SPGE section and see our financials as well. So um, I believe for now, sir, that's that's where we're, we stand through uh, January. Okay. With that, I need uh, would like to have a motion to accept the financial reports for the month ending January 31st, 2021. So moved. Do second. we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Financials are accepted. Thank you, Mr. Denton. Thank you. Uh, next one uh, on public comment and number six is on website customer comments. Ms. Poe, do we have anything? Kathy? I'm, uh, I, was, I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we only Either had the on, one. I'm sorry. We only had the one that was in the board package. Okay. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember what it was about, but uh, to my knowledge, it's been, yeah. been taken care of. Gentleman, gentleman was complaining about his uh, overly high usage rate one month. Right. Yes, his um, bill. Right. Do we figure out? Did we figure out what what uh, what happened there? Uh, Cassie or Vent? Um, I'm not sure. I don't have an answer for that. No, I I, I was unaware of it. I do, I do not know. 
Could you, could you follow up with us on that one, Ben, and let us know what sure, the situation we'll was, if it was a meter sure. problem or what it was? We'll do that. Okay. Uh, next is the department report. Ben, do you want to give us highlights on those? Yes, sir. Um, I'll just briefly go through the, the main points there. And if you have any questions, certainly interrupt me or, or I'll be happy to cover those at the end. Uh, the telecom report starts on page 107 to 110. Um, that's the pretty standard report you used to see in. I will talk a little bit about next band or our new uh, gig fiber project. Uh, the construction crews are working in the node 14 area, which would be Indian Hills, Ridgeview, Arnold Ridge area. So they're doing construction there. And our plan was to start some of the construction in the Shadrick Ferry area later this week, if the weather permitted. And so far the weather's not permitting. So I don't know if that'll get any better this week, but if not, we'll certainly start on next week on that. Um, in the electric department, uh, page 119 through 122 is the standard report. We are working on reconductor projects over on Battle Alley, several line extensions, and we're starting to order the materials the electric department will need for the Tiger Grant. When the water department's finished, the electric department will be next. So they're getting those things lined up. Um, even though the report information you get is for January, I will just briefly talk about we had an ice storm last week, um, a fairly small one. Um, the electric department had eight separate outages. They were contained to about 35 or less customers in those some of those areas. Uh, most of the outages were only about two hours long. Um, most of the causes were just limbs coming out of trees due to the ice issues of the weight from the ice. Um, the first outage started at about 7.30 at night and it in and the last outage that we had was about 7 30 in the morning but again the outages the longest ones were about two hours i think miss hale she got to ex got the lucky experience of being one of the <laughs> folks in that first one that we hit so, um so anyway uh that was uh really we were happy it wasn't any worse the ice uh, stayed to a fairly small amount compared to what we've seen in the past so we came through that pretty well on the electric side the telecom department also was very fortunate. They only had a couple of small issues. They had a number of calls, but most of those were for areas where there was no power. And when the power came back, the telecom came back as well. And then certainly as we're all aware, we're going through another winter storm currently today. And to date, we've had no issues and outages um, from the storm that we're having last night and today. So hopefully that will hold for us for the rest of the week. Um, AMI, in the uh, advanced metering infrastructure work, the lab testing is substantially complete and the materials for the pilot field area, they're on order and we expect to install about 500 meters as part of that pilot project in April. So that is going according to plan. Um, I'll jump down to the water distribution uh, report, the standard reports 129 through 131. The crews are now working on 2nd Street as part of the Tiger Grant project. They've installed about 250 feet of 12-inch pipe. And then the water crews are also working in another area for a specific customer. Um, I, I won't mention the customer's name in this particular case, but they're having an installation over there, and it's going to be 2,700 feet of 12-inch water main. So those are two projects with some fairly large water lines that we normally, you know, you don't see a whole bunch at one time. So the crews are definitely going to be working hard trying to keep up on all those projects so far that that has gone according to plan. Uh, the reservoir project for the water department, uh, the telecom department has got the dish farm has been completely moved. Now they're working on the backup power pieces for those dishes. Uh, we're still working on the temporary off-air antennas and the tower removal, the geotech work that'll be done with that for that new tower. So that stuff is being done to, again, pave the way for the actual reservoir work. And then on the reservoir itself, we have received the department or division of water approval at the first of this month. And we intend to advertise on the 19th of this month with the bid and a bid date to be back on the 12th of March. Um, we have a milestone date in the contract documents for the new tank to be in service on December the 15th of 21. Now that's in service of the tank, the grading, the wall, the landscape and all that stuff will still be coming on after that. So that's roughly the plan that is in place there. And then the water treatments plant, that report is on page 133. 
Uh, you see the statistics there for what, how much water we've treated. We didn't have any maintenance issues for uh, the month of January. And during the ice storm, the water treatment plant didn't have any issues. They did keep two operators there throughout the night. So they would, they would not have issues getting to the plant. And that's also how they're operating this week in the snowstorm. So all in all, it's been a busy last week and this week, obviously, and uh, all the normal stuff we're working on, I think they're going pretty well. And that would be my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions the board members might have. I just might want to add, and don't get me wrong, in a major ice storm, there's really nothing to protect you. I mean, when the ice hits and all that weight, but you know, I know I've asked questions before about how much we spend every year on the tree trimming contracts. But I think in times like this, it really shows the value of, of keeping up to date on those tree trimming uh, to cut down on the number of people uh, losing power because of limbs breaking off or whatever our lines. And I think that that kind of shows it's, it's a good expenditure. It's, it's, a, it's a fair amount of money, but it's, it's something I think pays off in dividends for both cost and for customers. So. Um, yeah, it, it, that's true, Mr. Cuban. If you didn't have, if we didn't have the uh, tree trimming program that we have in place, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to remember the budget. I think it's roughly a million dollars a year. If we didn't spend those monies and do that, the, the ice storm that we had, there would have been widespread outages throughout our system. It would have been a lot of issues. Our customers would have been out for days and days. There would have been a lot of overtime. Those expenses all, you know, sometimes they don't get realized. You know, you never think about the outages you don't have because you never had them. But that's a very good point. The uh, the tree trimming is part of that best practice that really pays dividend for the electric and the telecom department as well. Does any board members have any questions for Vin? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. As being one of, the, I think, the honor of having the first outage that night. And they did it for you, Don. They actually scheduled you to be out because they wanted you <laughs> to <sure>. first hands <laughs> in. <Yeah. laughs> I, I just wanted to say I really appreciate the guys being out there. It was miserable. I mean, it was the freezing rain and sleet, and it, I'm sure it was not a fun time out there that night. And so I just, you know, I think sometimes we forget about the people that are out there in the cold, in the rain, in the ice, and I just hope they know how much they are appreciated. Thank you. That was very kind of you. I appreciate that. Any other questions or comments for uh, Vin? Mr. Chair? Yes. I have a couple. Um, the first question I have is on the water treatment, um, the average daily production this January is below the past two Januaries. Can you give a real quick explanation about um, the difference in those productions? Julie, you unmuted. I was going to turn around and ask you if you could give us some details on that. I, I would not be able to do that. I think we are still seeing um, some effects of the COVID with, uh, I do know our commercial usage is down a little bit. Uh, and January's pumpage is always real difficult to, to predict because you never know if you're going to have an extremely cold January with a lot of folks running their uh, taps. We did not have that in January. So I think that was uh, another reason that we didn't uh, produce as much water as normal. And the second question I have was related to the topic of the tree trimming. Um, if, if there is a branch that looks like it's imminent to perhaps fall on a, on a power line, um, especially during weather like that, because usually that's when we all start to pay attention to those issues, what might the plant board's response be to a call like that? Yeah, if uh, if customers and, and we do get those calls from time to time, even outside of these storm issues, customers call and say, well, this tree is leaning over. I've noticed it's starting to lean over and that would fall on the power lines. Um, if customers just call us at our normal outage number uh, and just call and they can also send email comment on our on our website and, and do it that way as well. But if they just call our after hours line or during the day. Um, we take all those comments in we go out and investigate and we look at that. And if need be, our tree trimmers get up and work on that. 
Um, we, we find those, those comments and those notifications to be extremely helpful because it does help us in many times, many cases, it helps us to eliminate a problem before it happens. Um, we, we trim our lines in a rotational schedule so that you're back every couple of years. So obviously you could be gone for a year and not be in an area and the customers, obviously they see those things every day. So absolutely. If a customer has an issue, they think um, a line is, is coming down across our power lines, you know, to please call us and let us know. And we will go out there and take a look at it. If it's within the easement and we are able to, we will take care of it. Uh, sometimes we have issues where the trees are outside the easements. We're unable to necessarily cut those unless the homeowner gives us permission. But we do what we can. That's, that is a very good point. And does it matter whether it's a line from the pole to the house or from pole to pole? The pole from the the, uh, the line from the pole to the house is generally the customer's responsibility, their service line. But d depending on in ice storms and certain issues, depending on what it is, sometimes we'll we'll be able to take care of that. But we do not, as a general rule, we do not trim the service line from the pole to the house. Uh, we don't necessarily have easements in those issues, and most customers don't want you cutting the trees through their yard to their house. <clears throat> if a customer calls us and has an issue and wants us to look at a particular thing we can and there are exceptions to that rule sometimes we'll make um, but as a general rule your service line through your trees to your usually a backyard those are the customer's responsibility okay thank you thank you <laughs> any other questions for vent okay if not vent thank you yes sir uh, uh, next item and this is one we talked about in january and the board had some questions uh, this is uh, item 8.1, consideration of increased limits for directors and officers and uh, EPLI coverages. And I just wanted to start, Hans and Charlie Hamilton are going to discuss this. This one we talked about, and, you know, it's one of those issues that uh, you don't like to think about it, but it's not just a matter of protecting board members. It's in the case of an adverse court decision, uh, you know, protecting really the ratepayers because, if the plan board got hit on a large judgment, then it could affect the plan board having to pay for those costs, depending on the situation. So uh, board, the staff went back and did two things. They went back and looked. Uh, there were some questions about surplus property sales, that is items, scrap sales and so forth that we normally don't budget that revenue. And could that pay for this cost? And then the other is the board made some changes in our budget for this current year and with some considerable savings and if david didn't you can correct me with those savings it could pay for substantially the increased cost of liability insurance but i think the question the board needs to wrestle with is uh do we feel a need to raise it from the current levels and if so how much do we need to add in terms of extra coverage so hans you and charlie want to take it from here yes sir thank you uh i think uh mr cubine explained it very well uh, it's not only provides protection for the for the board and the and the staff, but also the but also the uh, the ratepayers. Uh, the, the board item has the uh, has the 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 items from one to five million uh, and the pricing associated with that for both the DNO coverage and the EPLI coverage. And then uh, David had also supplied some information uh, with respect to the surplus property sales that's also in the board item there. Uh, that will that would fluctuate, of course, from uh, from year year to year. Obviously, uh, you know, from a risk risk management perspective, I think uh, you know as much as the board is comfortable paying for is a is a good good practice. I think the you know just just like your just like your homeowner's insurance or your or your car insurance. You know, I think that the, the the more the more coverage you have, the the better off you're going to be to uh, to deal with some unexpected unexpected event. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Charlie Hamilton's joined us tonight, along with Stanley Marsnick. Uh, they can answer uh, you know answer any questions that uh, that you might have about the the pricing and and so on and so forth. Thank you, Charlie. If you could. Uh, uh mentioned in your, I know last time you provided some information about a, a utility our size and what would be where we're at and where what would be kind of what the average uh, coverage would be for an offer for a business our size. So if you can make sure you touch on that. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Cubine. Uh, yes, I think that the uh, it's kind of all over the place, but closely to what size Frankfurt Plant Board is would be close to the $10 million limit. Uh, there's an interesting point is that we're carrying lower or you're carrying lower limits on the directors and officers liability and employment practices liability insurance than you are your umbrella. So uh, the umbrella is for catastrophic and right uh, having higher limits on the directors and officers and employment practices is also catastrophic coverage too. There's no easy answer to how much uh, you need uh, the honest answer is as much as you can afford. And our current coverage level uh, on directors and on employment practices, what? It's $5 million, $5 million for each. And increasing our umbrella wouldn't solve the problem, right? No, sir, because the umbrella does not, it only fits over general liability, automobile liability, and, empl uh, and employer's liability of the workers' comp. Okay. Okay, open it up to any board members who have any questions or thoughts. I, I tell you, John, I, I'm willing to go to the to the uh, to the ten. We got we have surplus money at least for a year, and see mm -hmm. see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's been faced with that that really in their life in their in their career, uh, but sometimes it feels better to have it than not. And as I understand it, David, correct me if I'm wrong, for the next budget cycle, the fiscal year uh, 22-23 budget, which would be next year, from a budget standpoint, from the, the board budget, given the some of the changes we made this current budget in terms of reducing some costs, we basically, if we went to the 10 million for those two, we'd basically be back to where we were in fiscal year 20 board expenses. Is that correct? Or close to it? Yes, sir. You've had about a $35,000 reduction from 20 to 21, and that continues as we have it budgeted. So you are correct. Okay. So that would cover the directors and offices liability. And then I assume the employment practices would be spread across the company. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, sir. We do attach that to each employee in our budgeting process, you know, relating uh, to the employee. So it is budgeted that way. Okay. So for the current year, uh, the extra cost, when would this go into effect? Immediately or July 1st or April 1st or March 1st? Or when would it go into effect? We can put an effect anytime the board prefers. We can do it effective today, tomorrow. I would make it expire, mm -hmm. recommend we have it expire February 5 when the rest of the insurance expires so it'll all be on the same date. Okay. Hey, we have Steve's comment. Uh, do we have any other board member comments? John, um, yeah, John. John I, I agree with Steve. I, I think it's I think it's prudent for us to do that. And, and, and like you said, we have made the changes during the last budget cycle to cut some expenses on the board. And, you know, this is... I agree with what Charlie says. You, you don't you don't need it until you need it. When you need it, you better have it. So, um, you know, I, I feel comfortable with, you know, the thirty five thousand for the uh, B and O, and and then you know the fifteen thousand for the employment practice. I think is it's that's pretty cheap actually. So you know, I'm 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 also in favor of the ten million dollars on both. Okay, Catherine or Don? Yes, sir, Steve. Uh, and I, excuse me, I had to step out a second, but did y'all discuss the surplus money down yes. here? Yes. Surplus money? We didn't talk in detail. We talked about it was a source that we could use, certainly okay. current year, okay. but we didn't have a detailed discussion on the amounts, but okay. we talked about, yeah. Um, I was just going to say that I agree with Steve and, and John. I think we should go for the, the, uh, 10, the 10 million for the officers and directors and uh, same as with the employment practices liability. Catherine, uh, did you have any comments or thoughts? No, I'm agreeing with with the comments so far. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. A second? Second. second. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor of increasing the coverage 
the $5 million additional for DNO and the $5 million additional for employment practices. Uh, but that's what the motion is. So all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, and I guess make it effective. Steve, did you want to uh, state when you want it to be effective? Well, I go along with the recommendation to make it expire the, the, on the in the month of February, so it coincides with everything else. So, okay, so it be a uh, do we need an additional motion on that, or are we good with Steve's motion, or do we need to amend it, or? Well, I'll I can amend it if uh, if. Okay, you want to just make sure we do. Why don't you go on and to make it effective immediately and expire expired next February? The uh, the the uh, additional monies for the coverage. And that they shall expire on the uh, February of 2022. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. okay. So effective immediately. We, we can do it effective today if you like. Okay. Okay. So we've got Steve's amended motion, and do we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion's adopted. Okay, next item is legislative tracking. And this is one I asked Gary to present. Um, and let me just add, right now we currently, uh, like Gary is gonna talk, we use several sources. KMUA helps us and we see their reports and I know you all see them. And I guess the question here would be not to hire a lobbyist, but if we wanted probably for next session to find a retired person from state government, LRC or whatever, who could a couple hours a day uh, look over all the bills since we are across multiple lines. We're in water, we're in electric, uh, we're in telecom. Um, and to alert Gary and the board, uh, what's there not to recommend a position, but do identify it, review the bill and point it out to us. Uh, if we want to go that route, stay with our current, whatever, I'll turn it over to Gary and uh, let Gary kind of explain what we're currently doing and see where we want to go on this. And this is uh, an informational item. There's We don't have a proposal. Uh, we'd have to find someone to do the work. We're already um, pretty far into this session. So it would be probably for the 2021, 2022 regular session of the General Assembly. Gary, you want to take it? Oh, sure. Definitely. Uh, please, uh, all the board member, uh, if you have a comment and a suggestion, please stop me. Currently, like uh, Ms. Chairman mentioned, uh, that we use a KMUA. Uh, we are the member of KMUA. They represent us both on the legislation for the water and electrical. Uh, but uh, I don't think they focus anything on telecommunication. Um, well, I mean, we definitely right now, I mean, the practice is uh, KMUA has a two subcommittee, legislative committee. One committee has a uh, uh, Dress about electrical bill related, and also another is for the water. So um, KMUA always usually two committee to help them and to determine their position to support it or or against it uh, or neutral. Uh, that's kind of past the practice. Uh, I just want to try to explain to you and general public what are we doing right now. And I think if, if I'm correct, Gary, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, KMUA has their process and they review it. Uh, sometimes they might take a position that we, based on our own particular situation, we may or may not agree with. Um, and obviously we don't want to duplicate what they're doing. Obviously we've got some very good local representatives in both the House and the Senate. So if we saw something and we were concerned about it and KMUA either took a neutral or a different position than we were, then as a board, we'd have to make a decision whether we wanted to contact our legislators, express our concerns or whatever. So I guess this question is, um, do we feel like we have a need to create that in-house kind of review for an hour or two hours every morning to look at the, the legislative record, review amendments and bills, um, advise the board and then, uh, make a decision if we need to be for something against it or just uh, follow KMUA. So I'll kind of open it up for discussion at this point. Uh, John? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Don. Go ahead. 
I was just gonna say that I, I really think that we should have someone because, and this is not a criticism of KMUA, it's just that they don't cover telecom and telecom is really one of the most competitive aspects of our business. So I think it would be beneficial for us to have someone that is looking not only at electric and water, but also at telecom. So I think it would be worth it for us to spend the little bit that we would be spending in the long term. Um, it could save us money, you know, in the long run. Steve, Catherine, uh, John. Uh, John, um, you know, I guess the question I have, I've been through, I've been on the board through one legislative session. And mm -hmm. I guess I probably want to ask Gary and maybe some of the staff, uh, the question you brought up about our interests being divergent from those of KMUA. They could how be, often, yeah. How often, uh, how many issues have we come up with, either electric or water, where KM, KMUA either sat on the sidelines of something we really had a strong feeling about, or, you know, even they took one position and we really felt like the, the opposite position would have been better for us. How often do, do, do our interests diverge to that extent? Um, in my knowledge, in the last two and a half, three years, I think uh, kind of limited case. Um, I don't know how many count, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But there could be some case that they have uh, not a particularly interest in telecommunication. Maybe we do have uh, some concern. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I understand that's a different thing. Yeah. Most time, you know, I think working, even say the board would like to hire someone, you know, mm -hmm. which is I agree if, if you like to do. And uh, um, it's, it's more working together, just have a more information ahead of time then work together. Um, but I mean, it's really up to the board for this. You know, right now, one thing, uh, Ms. Snyder and uh, Ms. Cubano, Ms. Mason, you are definitely know better than I do. And uh, <laughs> there, there are so many proposal bill and some of them move very fast. <laughs> and uh, um, just take a days. I mean, that's a typically sometimes what I feel. Um, so, you know, that's, that's very hard to sum the bill right now, they are considered, um, you know, some the municipal really not like, uh, I, I'm not sure identify those things like 207, 238. And uh, um, there are a lot of concern, not just the plan board, uh, many city and uh, municipal. Right but not necessary we can do much either sometimes. Right. So right. involve more, understand more, um, work more closely with our legislator, all going to be positive things, right? So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we had someone that was a retiree or whatever on a contract basis during the session, not a, an employee, um, we wouldn't be, as we've talked, as we're talking about it, not looking to hire a lobbyist, but it would be up to then Gary or staff to make the contract contact with legislators and express our concern. We wouldn't be hiring someone uh, to basically go up there and lobby for us or testify or something like that if we see the need for it. Steve? No, what, what I was going to say is, one, I think that'd be a relatively inexpensive uh, uh, endeavor to have. But to your question, John uh, Snatter, um, I think there was a, a significant bill either last session or the session before that I think, in my opinion, that the plan board might not have been uh, uh, in favor of, but yet KYMA may have been in favor of, uh, that because John was watching the session and, and, and you were watching it, I saw it, um, we knew about the bill, so I'm not sure it, it just didn't, you take you and John off who may watch track of this stuff, you may not, some of these things may not come. Then, the, you know, there's big telecom types of uh, legislation out there. And, you know, one of the things I think about is how that impacts us, you know, um, 
as we pursue our issue. If it ever, it will impact us. So I, I you know, I, I don't envision this to be a lot of money. And I mean, really uh, just very little money to do this. And I think it might be, if nothing else keeps us attuned to what's happening as it relates to us, if it doesn't do anything else. Well, you know, I, I try to pay as much attention as I can to as much as I can, but you know, I've got a, I've got a job to do that has nothing to do with. But, uh, you know, if you, think, if you if you look at it in the context of we're faceless board members, and oh you know, yeah, someone did not work at LRC, yeah, then, then think of the position. Sure, so that's absolutely, kind of where I'm looking at. Um, absolutely. Catherine, do you have some thoughts on it? Um. As far as for budget reasons, I too would want to keep it very minimal, keep it just to tracking and potentially just to tracking telecom. Um, as already has been pointed out, KMUA is, is doing um, that work on the water and electric side. It would be nice to coordinate with them potentially to change their process a little bit, whereas we get um, some notice. I mean, I'm not, I know how fast the legislature um, moves during session. Um, so I'm not talking like, you know, even 24 hours, but some notice between when the subcommittee makes its recommendation on a, a bill that's been flagged of potential interest that we get that, you know, proposed position before it goes public. Um, just so we have a little bit of opportunity, one, maybe to give our input to KMUA. Um, and if, if that's, you know, if their mind is set on their position and it happens to be divergent from ours, that at least we've got a little notice um, uh, and to um, Gary's point, if we've made um, a concerted effort before the session to um, speak with our legislators, um, then on those rare occasions, you know, I think we'll have the relationship where we can express why our position's not the same um, with KMUAs. Those are my thoughts. Here's what, just doing some quick, if we assume we could find someone, and I have no idea what the market is, but somebody retired who might want to do this for a couple hours. Uh, 10, 12, 12. How, if the board would feel comfortable, if we want to, but like I said, we're, we're pretty far into this session. But if Gary would want to look and see if we could find someone for the 2022 session who might be interested in doing this work for us to review both some pre-file pre legislation and bills during the session, one or two hours a day, and bring us back a proposal at the November meeting. And the idea being we wouldn't spend more, say, than $4,500 total for the session. If we could find someone who might want to do that work and to bring it back at the November meeting, and then we can make a final decision at that point if we want to go forward and uh, contract with someone or what we're going to do. And that also gives us a chance to work some more with uh, uh, KMUA during the summer about maybe refining their process a little more. So basically not a formal motion, but just a direction for Gary to do that research and bring us something in November. And then we can make a decision if we want to do that. Does that sound reasonable? And Gary, do you think, I don't think we need a motion. I mean, we're not authorizing you to, the contract or harsh one, but take a look at it, identify if there's someone out there who might be interested uh, that you feel might, you know, have the qualifications and uh, experience to read those for us. And the key on that, and, uh, Steve and I and John have, have done it a lot. I mean, the key is being on top of it from day one, not letting it build up. And then you can kind of stay on top of the amendments and bills every day and watch them. Uh, trying to jump into it at this point with hundreds of bills filed, um, and stuff moving would be hard, but if you're on it from day one, it's, and you're, and you've got just a couple of topics, um, you can, you can do it fairly quickly because of some of the software LRC has and 
setting up bills and topics and headings and indexes. Does that seem like a reasonable way to go? Um, John, Mr. Chairman, um, yes, sir. Is does this set us up for an issue if Gary identifies an individual and then we decide to do something? Uh, where are we in terms of our contracting hands? Is that going to get us into trouble if we essentially almost pre-select someone or, or kind of ferret that out? If they were a you know, Hans, if they were a 1099 employee, what would that be? I, th I think they'd be an independent contractor, obviously first, and I think it would qualify also as a professional service. service. So you might uh, send it out as a, uh, you know, just maybe an RFP, something along those lines. And if I, if I might take a moment, I, I recall in a couple of years, somebody was talking about telecom. I think at one point, maybe John Higginbotham was, uh, there was some telecom stuff going on with KMUA. So might, mm -hmm. might want to uh, see if there's still anything going on there with, with the telecom side of thing, things as well. I, 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 I talked to you. Uh, vague memory, vague memory. I talked to Annette uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago just to see what she was doing. And I got the impression, although I've seen a few uh, broadband things, Annette, I think she's probably more focused on water and electric. Don't you, Gary, than she is on broadband and telecom and cable? There are some interest because yeah. of the uh, some the utility has uh, some the fiber service mm -hmm. or uh, but not a lot of them have a, like a full scale. We have a cable, yeah. internet, telephone, all the security. Okay. I don't think they're very limited utility has low service like municipal in Kentucky. So Gary, if we go along this path, basically just uh, kind of giving you the assignment of uh, next November, this coming November, bringing us some options and some proposals. And if you found someone and they're yes. willing to work and you think they can do it and work with you and the staff, and then we can kind of decide then if we want to do it. Yes. Uh, like uh, Hans suggests, we're going to have a formal process. And mm -hmm. ask them, I mean, you invite the people, have a, give us some kind of proposal. Mm -hmm. Then we have a, a normal process for this. You know, we make sure we're going to follow the rule for our yes. purchasing. And then uh, I will make sure I update you, the board. And, and the meanwhile, we have a budget process. We'll be all included before yes. the yes so we'll, we'll be all in line when we you know you need it if that's the direction board want to do i think yeah. we can make that happen yeah this would be a great gig you can sit at home in your pajamas and do this in the morning this would be good <laughs> uh so gary if you'll just kind of follow up on that and then uh make sure kathy poe make sure you put this on the agenda for um uh, uh november yes sir i have it written down okay thank Just you all here. next one is uh, 8.3 consider oh, approving chair. the public oh i'm sorry excuse me i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry can i have one question can you just clarify when you spoke to the executive director of kmua mm -hmm. um did you ask her if they had any interest in perhaps expanding um looking into telecom during the legislative session we didn't talk then it was a very general conversation we did talk about um, the fact that, you know, what her process is and how she works it and then how she vets the positions with her, uh, with her various committees and about if we, if we, if the board wanted to go this way, could there somehow that we supplement her resources, not duplicate them and work with her group for whatever information. So, cause I think just from talking with her, I, I don't think, you know, to get in a situation where we're taking one position, her another, and I think like uh, John and Steve mentioned, and you mentioned, um, timing is just so fast on some of these issues, especially amendments, that if we see something that worries us uh, to let her, let Gary know that there's a concern, to make sure they know we're concerned. And then, of course, we're always faced with the possibility that some of the utilities will be forward, some will be against it. And then I think that probably forces KMUA in almost a neutral position. And then we've kind of got to decide, uh, are we concerned enough about it to ask Gary and him to contact our legislators or just, you know, how concerned we are. So I think it, it's a topic that deserves some work during the, the interim to kind of define exactly what, 
we're going to be doing and what she's doing and can we work out something jointly that maybe means we don't have to even do this. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, next item is 8.3. Consider approving public hearing notice concerning covering tariff revisions to AMI deployment and opt out. Travis. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Members of the board. As Vint mentioned in the departmental reports, the AMI project is progressing nicely. We're, we're kind of wrapping up the testing phase, which means we'll be moving out to, to installing meters at customer premises soon, um, which means we will need to adopt some kind of uniform policy to address customers that have, you know, various concerns about having an AMI meter installed. Most utilities have adopted the practice of having an opt-out policy that allows the customers, customers that choice that, that don't want an AMI meter, but also has a fee associated with it that will recover the cost of the increased, uh, the increased cost of providing service. So staff working with our, our consultant at Mass Solutions has drafted a policy for the board's consideration. It includes a, a, a one-time fee to recover the cost of any kind of meter change out or back office process and a, a recurring monthly fee to cover the cost of that, that manually reading. Uh, we also referred to a, uh, a policy that the Public Service Commission has approved for Kentucky, um, an opt-out policy. It, it looks very similar to, to what we've drafted. So we, we think there's a, a good standard there. Uh, I think we're, what we propose is in line with what other utilities are doing. Um, be happy. You said, Travis, this is similar to what Duke Power is doing? This is this is very similar to what Duke has done in Kentucky. So the, the Public Service Commission, uh, as far as I know, that's the biggest deployment the PSC has approved so far, um, or one of the earliest anyway. So it's, it's a very similar policy. It has a one-time fee, um, has a monthly recurring fee. There are some limitations on who is eligible to opt out. Uh, again, of course, the, the idea being you know, we think it's a great program. We want we want all of our customers to participate in it. We think it's a better service, um, but we want to have some means for those customers that are just, you know, absolutely adamant they they don't want an AMI meter. So um, this would be uh, one, one alternative for them. So again, I think um, what we propose is is pretty well in line with most utility practices. Be again be. Happy to answer any questions about what we propose here. Um, my thoughts were the, the public hearing could be concurrent with the, the March meeting. We've got plenty of time to do that. Um, we're not necessary, necessarily up against a wall time-wise. So um, kind of the, the standard public hearing and tariff revision process is what we had in mind. Uh, one month ahead for the public hearing and then, then the next regular board meeting. Uh, assuming the board is in favor adopt the policy so that would that would have us prepared for what we expect to be the full system-wide deployment to begin in july that's that's the the current time frame do you have any questions for travis i just had one um it on your uh opt-out presentation mm -hmm. thing here you have a box for opt-out processing fee and non-standard meter install of $100. So is that saying that even if they opt out of the AMI meter, they still will be having a new meter installed so their current meter would be removed? Most customers, yes, to answer your question, yes, they, they will still get a new meter. The metering system we have in place is um, past its useful service life. It needs to be upgraded in some form or fashion. So, yes, it is likely they'll, they'll receive a new meter. It just won't be a, a digitally communicating meter. Thanks. Sure. And I think one of the things, Travis, um, that you mentioned is we've got some very good employees who do the meter reading right now and do a great job. And as we go into this, uh, I think from a board, if the board agrees, and I mean, we don't need to take any formal motion on this part, but. Uh, certainly as we phase into to let those employees know how many is it we have total Travis to do it, do the meter reading. I think it's seven. Um, David may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's currently seven. And that we do everything we can to 
uh, find other spots for them in the company as we implement this. So we're not pulling the rug out from under those employees. We're going to be saving the money from reading the meters, which is part of the savings to do it, but find other positions within the company for them uh, to let them know that we're going to be trying to work with them to, to have some place, something else for them to do within the company. Is that correct, Travis? Yeah, I think certainly the idea is that AMI will create new job roles. We, mm -hmm. we kind of expected that from the beginning, and that was always included in the, the budgeted cost. But again, there's always, you know, there's always some some other jobs open as well. So it may not be limited just to that. Um, right. Yeah, I think that's that's been the understanding. Yes. So I guess the question on this is, is to authorize or approve conducting a public hearing at the March meeting on this proposed rate structure for people who opt out. And then you all do the appropriate notices and then we have the hearing in March um, to, for any comments, whatever, as to this, this approach. Is that correct? That was my expectation. Of course, it's at the board's pleasure, but uh, that would allow us plenty of time to get the policy in place before we're, we're in full system wide deployment. But I think it makes sense from our perspective. Yes. And how long will it take to deploy to fully implement all the new meters? It's about a two year process is what we've planned. Yeah. So we've got to go to all 21,000 electric and 16,000 plus water meters. So yeah, about okay, a two any year. questions for Travis? Chair. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm assuming the proposed monthly fee would to be to cover um, the manual reading that would have to be done for the opt out customer. Um, is the rationale for the one time proposed fee to cover the costs um, that we would incur if that customer moves from that address, we would then, unless the next customer opts out, we would then have to go install an AMI um, uh, enabled meter at that point. So is that the rationale for the one-time fee? Yeah, I think maybe I should give a little more background on that. So we propose in the policy, if you give us notice Prior to having your meter changed, that fee could be waived. I think that's a, a reasonable proposal. So if we we send notice where, hey, we're going to be in your area changing out meters, you call and say, no, I want to opt out. We could waive that fee because, again, that, that one-time fee is the cost to go to your, your house and change out your meter from an AMI meter to a non-standard. So if we know in advance, um, that's very similar to what the PSC adopted. Assuming if you don't give us notice in advance, or again, if you move to a location that already has an AMI meter, the intent there is to cover the cost of sending a technician to the house to change the meter or reprogram the meter, however, it, you know, whatever the case may be. And there's also some, some customer service and IT processes that'll have to take place. So that's the intent there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of Travis? Okay, if not, do we have a motion? I think I see one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is there someone else? Yeah, it's me. I had I was on this. I'm sorry. Uh, let me further understand the uh, the one time fee. So, whether you accept opt out or opt in, you're going to pay a hundred dollars at the time y'all start implementing this uh, insulated installing these AMI. The the idea is again, if if you tell us before we change your meter. I th it's reasonable to me that you don't have to pay that $100 okay. fee. So if we, if we haven't already changed you out, we could, we could waive that again. That's what Duke energy did. I th I've seen that other places as well. So it, it's really the intent is just to cover the cost to send that meter, send a technician to change out that meter. If you already have an AMI meter, that's so, but going back to Steve's question, if I'm like, in my case, if I'm going to take the AMI meter, I'm not, there's no, there's no $100 charge to me. If I'm, if you're just going to switch me over to AMI, right? Correct. Yeah, that's that's true across the board with AMI. I think it's important to point that out. We don't expect any any rate changes, any additional fees directly related to AMI. So if you're um, okay, assuming you're okay with having an AMI meter, you shouldn't expect any changes to your bill. There's no, no there's no hundred dollar fee if you accept it when you bring it. Right. There's no there's no opt in fee. I guess you could you could say 
frame it that way. Yes. If okay. you accept the AMI meter, you're not going to have to pay to upgrade, if you will. That'll be that'll be the standard regular service going forward. Okay. My other my other question is, and I I, I looked at that some other states that have this have the opt-in uh, clause have has reduced charges for economically disadvantaged people that uh, opt out. So there was a income threshold that reduced the charge at month the monthly charge for people who are economically disadvantaged. Uh, and, you know, that, I think that's something that needs to be considered. That gives everyone the opportunity, the equal opportunity, if you will, to opt out if they want to, because $21 a month for one person is, is a killer bill for some other person. And if there's, if there can be some adjustments for, and I don't know if you have economic, the data on people's, uh, income and debt in your files now, but that appealed to me that, you know, the ability, if you wanted to opt out, that the penalty to some people wouldn't be double what it would be to others. Okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, we can explore that. Of course, the, the fee schedule is um, ultimately the, of course, the board's decision. Um, so um, if it makes sense to the board, I can, investigate that further and, and pass along some of that information uh, in advance. Hey, Jim, um, did you want to say something? something? Yeah, I would like to, um, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily, we don't have any, any information on a customer's income or income levels to do something like that. I mean, we can definitely look into it, but to do something like that would require uh uh, application based on from the customer based on their income we'd have to show proof of income our customer service reps would have to find some way to try to establish that those records are accurate we'd have to have those kind of applications and then we'd have to continually update those because that's a monthly fee maybe you have to review it every year it, it, I mean we can do that but I do want the board to understand that's a pretty well, Pretty know, significant it's lift. been 55 years since I first applied to the plan board for utilities. And I thought y'all had asked for my income at the time, being 20 something. So I, I thought I thought income was part of the application process. I don't remember, it's been 50 years. Well, we, to address what Steve's asking, uh, Travis, when we come back in March, we'll have the public hearing and then we'll have the period after that for comments and then decide on a final policy. When we come back in March, uh, if you would do the research in terms of does anyone else uh, who has uh, implemented AMI that you can find have adopted any type of hardship policy or whatever for people who want to apply and say, I don't want this meter because of X reason and bring that to us and let's take a look at what you found out. The NCSL site that you had in your report showed a state that did that. Okay. So if we could have that at the March thing, then we'll kind of go from there and then the board can consider that along with any other comments we get, if that's okay with you, Steve. Yes, that's fine. Okay. So do I have a motion to can authorize? I, I'm sorry. I just had a comment. Um, isn't one of the benefits of AMI that it helps people have more control over their bill? So therefore, low-income people would be benefited by having AMI because they can prepay, they can uh, just have more control over the energy that they're using. So maybe to alleviate some of what Steve is talking about, we would just need to have some education going out before we institute AMI so people realize that it is going to help them possibly lower their bill to begin well, with. Well, my point, Don, is that poor people have the same fears and concerns as, as well-to-do people. Some well-to-do people may not want for privacy concerns, reasons, the ability, they, they can opt out and what have it. Mm -hmm. Poor people have those same privacy concerns. And if it's, if it's, it's cost prohibitive for them to opt out, then all I'm saying is let's look at a way to make it equi equitable for them to be able to opt out for the same privacy reasons. Okay. 
Travis, could I ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Travis, can you ask a question? For Duke application, how much they charge monthly to the customer to read uh, their meter? I think it was, it was slightly higher than what we proposed. I think theirs is 25 a month. Okay. Thank you. And I've seen them, you know, all over the board, but I think that's that's a pretty, pretty standard. And we're well within kind of what you would call standard range. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, assuming we move forward with the public hearing in March or, or mm -hmm. thereafter, um, I would just want to make sure that there um, would be a good um, link in the public notice for as much information about AMI as possible. Mm -hmm. Good, um, yes. I think you're exactly right because that, that's where we're going to have to start the education process in terms of what this is. And, and Steve makes a good point. I mean, there are privacy issues. There's also some consumer benefits, uh, but a lot of people are going to say this is another way for people to to intrude on what I'm doing. I mean, so we do need that public education. Yeah, absolutely agree. I think the the hope is again we, we hope everyone participates. We think it's a great program, but um, yeah, absolutely understand. And you know, we'll we'll do our best to educate those customers that maybe just you know, don't know a lot about AMI and they call and they say, Hey, I don't really want this. Maybe they just, you know, we need to explain it better. Um, so a website dedicated to AMI is, is in the works. I think, I, I think it's nearly ready uh, to, to be public. So we've addressed With some frequently of, asked questions and things like that. Exactly. Privacy, security, um, health concerns, those kind of things. And, and again, touching on a lot of the, the customer benefits as well. Okay. Maybe a, an around 10 program dealing with it too would be good. Sure. Mm -hmm. That means Travis, you're going to get to be a guest, a guest star on uh, the Kathy Lindsay show. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> I, I think she may have already thought about that. Is there? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, uh, so do we have a, do we, <laughs> we have discussed it. <laughs> so do we have a, a motion to schedule the public hearing on the AMI deployment opt-out for the March board meeting and for staff to do the proper public notices uh, with an emphasis on providing uh, the public information uh, so that people understand exactly what that proposal is about prior to the March meeting. Do we have a motion on that? So no, moved. And do we have a second? Second. second. Okay, uh, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Are those opposed, no. Motion's approved. Thanks, Travis. Uh, next one, consider approving at number 8.4, consider approving professional service contract for fiber to the home network design with rainbow design services in the amount not to exceed $650,000. Adam? Yes, sir. Chairman, members of the board, uh, staff would recommend approval of the award professional service contract for fiber to the home design for uh, rainbow design services. Uh, staff sent out an RFP on November the 11th. We had four companies respond. Uh, a team of six staff members score each company's proposal based on the criteria. Upon review, staff recommends rainbow network design to provide FPB with fiber to the home assistance or design assistance. Rainbow uh, Design Company is based out of Louisville or has a, a large branch office out of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they've done infrastructure design for 25 plus years. Um, they've been involved with many fiber to the home uh, projects similar to ours. Uh, they've worked with Bardstown Cable and um, this will help staff speed up the next band project at the board and asked that we look into. So this was uh, one of the major pieces into speeding the project up. Uh, Hans has reviewed the documents and uh, uh, says it's good to go. How about the $650,000, uh, Adam, you and David, how's that being handled? Uh, well, I'm glad you brought that up. This is actually basically uh, piecework. So from between now and July, I wouldn't see us going much over $100,000. This was just the total contract sum. And this will be put out in stages because we don't want the design work to get done too far ahead of the uh, 
actual construction. And the reason for that is uh, areas like the Second Street Corridor Project. If we let them design everything, then we have a street or a neighborhood project come up, we'll have to spend money and redesign. So we will stage the design just ahead of construction. And so everything kind of flows together as one project. Uh, so like I said, it'd probably be less than $100,000 this fiscal year. I think we have the funds. Uh, I've talked to David. We have some additional funds that I think will cover this. Great. Any questions for Adam? Okay, do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Do we have any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's approved. Contract's approved. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, number 8.5, consider award of bid invitation number 1708, electric meeting materials to power line supply in the amount of $45,141.30. Jennifer Heller. Good evening, board members. Um, we're going to go back to the AMI a little bit. Um, when they do put all the new meters in, um, of course, the old ones will be removed. And there's several small pieces and parts that we use now currently that will have to be replaced for every meter they replace. Um, so this uh, bid was for a bulk order of all of those items. Uh, normally we just order those to replenish stock as needed. Um, we will, since we will need a large amount on hand, um, we, we did the bid for the large um, quantities. So we sent the bid to, um, it, it was publicly advertised we sent it directly to seven vendors and four responded. Um, they reviewed, we reviewed all the bids. These are all the exact same parts, um, manufacturer, basically just um, their pricing, no one bid, you know, different manufacturers or part numbers. Um, so the, uh, the lowest bidder that met those specifications was Powerline Supply. And this is all included in the budget for AMI. Uh, and you know these are just just a bulk order needed to get those new meters installed. Okay. Any questions for Jennifer? Okay. Uh, seeing none, do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed. Motion's approved. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Number 8.6, Harvey, you're back. Uh, number 8.6, consider approving tennis channel agreement. Harvey. Thank you, sir. Uh, members of the board. Uh, staff recommends approval of the tennis channel uh, agreement. This is an NCTC agreement with a term through December 31st of 2023. Um, FB, FPB originally launched a tennis channel back in the summer of 2013 on preferred cable. Uh, it was later purchased by Sinclair, and when uh, we did our renewals with Sinclair for Retrans three years ago, um, in order to continue carrying Fox 56, we were required to move Tennis Channel down to Classic Cable. Since then, Sinclair uh, transferred ownership of Fox 56 to Nexstar, which is who uh, we did our renewal with back in December. They required launch of a WGN America, which we did in uh, about a month ago. Um, but at the same time, uh, Sinclair no longer had that requirement in place for us to carry it. Um, so we've been working with Sinclair for the last month to try to get a relaunch back on preferred uh, cable where it was prior to, um, to help offset some of that uh, additional cost on classic cable. Um, and so we were finally able to get that done uh, through uh, through Sinclair and, and the NCTC. So we're asking uh, approval of this agreement uh, for carriage of the tennis channel to relaunch it on preferred cable uh, channel 151. Um, my understanding is that we're going to be able to do this tomorrow uh, with the with the operations folks. So. And there's no additional charge for this. The well, I mean, no, no additional charge to the rate payers. I mean, there is an associated charge for the channel, like, uh, like, uh, like all the channels, but um, there, there'll be no, no um, increase required on preferred cable. Uh, it's in the budget and um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions of Harvey? Okay. If not, 
Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in uh, seeing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's approved. Thanks, Harvey. You're up again on cons number 8.7. Consider an approval, approving amendment to Smithsonian Service Agreement, and two, amendment to CBS Sports Network Agreement, and three, amendment to CBS Television Network Video On Demand. Harvey. Thank you, sir. Um, these are direct agreements with CBS uh, for carriage of Smithsonian Channel, uh, which is on preferred cable, and CBS Sports Network, which is on preferred cable, and then the CBS uh, Broadcast Network Video On Demand, which is available to, uh, to all cable TV customers. Uh, our existing agreements were expiring at the end of this year. Uh, we engaged with CBS to get uh, distribution rights for, for Moby TV for an expand stream product. Uh, and they asked that we, uh, instead of just granting an amendment uh, for, the, for the rest of our term, they just wanted to, to just do an amendment to extend out our existing uh, agreement. So this pushes out uh, to the end of 2024, uh, the same terms uh, the, the increases of less than 5% annually um, and uh, maintains our existing agreement for a uh, no cost uh, carriage of, of CBS VOD. So we think it's uh, beneficial to, to our customers uh, to execute these amendments. So happy to, uh, to answer any questions you may have on these items. Okay, any questions of Harvey? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Your motion for I'm sorry, your motion. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, make, I'll make it. I'll make it. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Now, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's adopted. Harvey, uh, consider a cable advisory committee appointment. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'd ask the board to appoint uh, Ms. Christine Bryant to the Cable Advisory Committee with the term beginning February 17th, 2021 through February 16th, 2024. Appointment is needed to fill the vacancy created by the expiration of Ms. Alicia Morris's term. Staff advertised the opening uh, of the volunteer position in the State Journal on our website, Facebook and Twitter pages. It's also advertised on Cable 10 and on Around 10. A copy of Ms. Bryant's resume and letter of interest is included for you. Uh, uh, for your review and uh, staff would like to just take a moment to recognize uh, Ms. Morse's service to the Cable Advisory Committee. She served from 2014 uh, until 2020. We appreciate her service and her contribution to FPB and this community. Okay. Any questions of Harvey regarding this recommendation? Hey, if not, do we have a motion to approve Ms. Bryan? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ms. Bryan's appointed. Thanks, Harvey. Anything else you want to talk about, Harvey? Why, we, you're up again, aren't you? Just one, just one more, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey, consider approval of public hearing notice to establish terms of service uh, for next bay and stream powered by mobile TV. Harvey. Thank you, sir. And, and I, I want to apologize if you can if you can hear the five year old in the background has very strong opinions about his eight year old brother. Uh, <laughs> um, as FPB gets closer to rolling out uh, our app based video service uh, powered by Moby TV, uh, the term their uh, terms of service are uh, required by Moby, uh, and we need to get those established. These terms um, essentially the customers will accept these terms uh, when they launch the app, and um, and so uh, in working with the uh, staff attorney, he, he recommended that we bring this to you guys for a, a public hearing process. And since uh, Travis was, was um, doing the same thing, we thought we'd just sort of ride along with him. And uh, so the terms of use are, are included for your uh, information and review. And we'd ask that this be uh, included in the public hearing uh, that's already, I guess, is scheduled for next month. So we're, we're going to have a total of, what, three public hearings next month? Is that correct? Is that right, Gary? We've got this uh, one, we've got Travis's, and then we had one early on the agenda, didn't we? Another public hearing? 
Well, no, that was you well, held we'll the public hearing. Yeah. 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 You held the public hearing today. So you'd be approving the rates at next yeah. month. Yeah. So just okay. two public hearings tomorrow. Yeah. Next month. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so this would be, we'd be conducting this public hearing at the March board meeting. Is that correct? correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions of Harvey? Okay. Seeing none, do we have a motion to conduct the public hearing at the March board meeting? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Uh, public hearing scheduled for March. Uh, next, 8.10. I understand, Gary, we're going to pass over this. Yes, Mr. Chairman and uh, board member. Uh, I do not have a current information um, available for you to discuss. You know, um, if we have a future have, or either we have a special meeting or an export meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, number 8.11. Uh, determine relocation site of the old steep pump wheel piston and marker currently located at the reservoir. Mr. Billings. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, if the board recall, we discussed this at the January meeting and uh, we, we it was decided to put this on the agenda for possible action at the pre-agenda meeting. Staff was asked to reach out to uh, Capital City Museum and the State Historic Preservation Office, which we did. I heard back from uh, Mr. Uh, Hatter today, and his thoughts are that these exhibits would be better placed at Cove Spring Park. Okay. So I didn't know how that would enter into the discussion or the decision. So I guess we'll just open up the floor. Okay. So you talked to the historic, you talked to them, and I they said, basically. I sent an email to Mr. Sanders, who's mm -hmm. with the historic office, and Mr. Hatter, who's with the Capital City Museum. I received a response back from Mr. Hatter and his position is he thinks that would be better at Cold Spring Park. His reason, and Cold Spring was the site of the first reservoir, the first water that system? Is, that is correct. His reasoning is that the park has many visitors for hiking and picnicking, and he thinks they could design a specific exhibit containing all three components, not just the two. Uh, he That would have to go, of course, through the Parks and Recreation Department and Sean Pickens, who we've already talked to about this. And what was Sean's interest in it at that point? At that time that we talked to him, he said it, it's a possibility, but he thought that that decision would have to uh, also go through Parks and Rec, as well as perhaps even the city commission, maybe. That's so at this point, and if we did that, then we would actually turn that over to them and they would become their property, is that correct? Uh, that's the way I interpret it, yes. Okay. So I guess at this question, obviously it's going to, things are, and I think you'd mentioned, David, we're going to have to remove these items regardless. And then they're going to have to go somewhere and get refurbished. Whether they're either brought to the admin building or they go up to Cove Spring. So I guess at this point, last time we talked, there was some interest on the board of going to the admin building. Uh, Mr. Hatter thinks there's some historic significance to going to Cove Spring. So I guess the question is, how's the board want to proceed at this point? Chair? Yes. I believe I was the one that had made the suggestion to um, speak to the historic preservation officer. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking of the city's historic preservation officer, mm -hmm. Vicki Berenberg. Okay. So at this point, uh, since we've got Mr. Hedder's thing, do we want to make a go to talk to that historic officer or do we want to make a formal uh, letter to, I guess, parks to the city and to the historic officer and ask them formally, are, are they interested in doing this with, uh, I guess, our default position being to relocate the wheel and the piston to the admin building and leave the marker at the reservoir, uh, which is a smaller item is, is that a way we want to proceed or how do we want to proceed at this point? I, I think, I think doing that gets to, uh, to Catherine's concern about talking mm -hmm. to the city's historic preservation officer, kind of dump it in there, you know, for lack of a better word, since they're going to have to approve it anyway, make sure it's something to see if they're interested in it. And then if they want to go ahead and proceed and, 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 and take it and, and take it off our hands and, and set it up on the, on the city park, 
that'd be fine. We always have the fallback we can put at the administration building and keep the the uh, the marker um, near the reservoir. We always had that as a fallback position. I don't know okay, if it's so, something. I didn't want to restate what you what you thought, but it's to me it seems like it it it, it, it kills two birds with one stone. So the motion would be that we formally direct uh, Mr. Zing to formally communicate with the city, the, the historic officer, and the historic and parks, yes. and describe what we've got and ask them formally, gauge, are you interested to in gauge, these items? To gauge their interest, yes, sir. That would be the motion I would make. And to tell me if they're not interested, then we'll more than likely go to an alter location, which may in fact be the admin building. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does that, Catherine, does that address what your concern was? Yes. Uh, John, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Steve, you and Dawn, what do you think? No, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I, I, I do have a further question, though, and it's probably a down the road question. As it, you said, it had to be rehabilitated. And, you know, you know, I, I could imagine a question would come from anyone that is willing to take this and put it in their property or in their possession. You know, who who does the. Uh, uh, rehabilitation who who i assume that regardless and i'm just this is just me i'm i'm assuming that regardless of what we do we've probably got some duty i think what you said david what to sandblast it do some things and get it in shape to to go somewhere i'm concerned both of the piston and the wheel are sitting in concrete mm -hmm. so you you can't see what's under the concrete i would expect some severe corrosion to be occurring there uh, to take care of that. That's going to have to be busted out of the concrete anyway. So mm -hmm. at a minimum, I would think hand tooling probably needs sandblasting and a good coat of two-part epoxy paint would be my guess. So, um, so I guess what we'd be asking for is the city's expression of formal interest with the understanding that we'd remove it and I guess deliver it to them in position for them to take in, in condition for them to take possession of it. And then at that point, once they take possession, it serves, but we we would give it to them in a, we would deliver it to them in, in condition enough that they could install it. Is that correct? Yeah. Was that reasonable? Yeah. Okay. So I guess at this point, do we have a, a motion to direct uh, the general manager to, to formally communicate yeah. that to the three Entities we discussed? Yes, so moved. And we have a second. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Any further discussion? Would you like for me to reach out to a local firm that does sandblasting and painting and get a quote on that? I mean, I think, well, first let's deal with the, the motion. Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Th those opposed? Okay, motion's approved. Uh, the next would be, and I don't know if we need a formal motion, but I do think probably, David, you probably, like you said, we need to get a, we need to get some idea of what it's going to cost to remove it, bust it out of that concrete, put it in some shape, haul it in that, and we need some idea of what that expenditure is regardless of where it ends up. Um, because that's going to have to be done no matter whether we keep it or we uh, transfer it to the city. It will be done. Okay, and then you can present that. Uh, Hopefully at the March meeting, you can give us an update. Gary can give us an update on if he's gotten a response from the city and the parks and from uh, the historic officer and then what the cost, what we're looking at in terms of cost. Okay. Informational items. Uh, number 9.1, Hans, uh, Ethics Committee. Yes, sir. Uh, nothing to add much more than what's in the agenda there. We've made contact with folks. Uh, got some dates lined up with everybody and are getting the forms in. So things are going going well. Thank you. Okay. Um, no actions required on that information discussion. Uh, the tank at 127. Um, I think, David, you've gotten some price estimates of what it might cost uh, oh. if there was interest in, um, in putting welcome to Frankfurt or some other type information on that water tank at the Dairy Queen on by the Dairy Queen on the west side. Uh, you want to take it and let us know what you found out. Yeah, I'll take it. It's Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kathy. Oh, that's that's okay. right. Yeah, you're taking this one. Okay. Well, I'm working with David on it, and <laughs> he got uh, he has just some. Uh, oh, here. Well, let me back up. I'll start over. 
in uh, in 2018 when we when we launched Frankfurt on Tap, uh, our, the branding of our tap water. We talked about different ways we could market that. And one idea that we had was to, we, we had our logo, the front new Frankfurt on Tap logo. One of the ideas we had was to put it on our water tank because, you know, it's water. It's the brand of our water and it's the water tank. <laughs> so when we talked to the water department about it, the, uh, the former super, water superintendent, Alan Smith, said he thought it was a great idea, but that we should wait until after... Um, that he knew that the tank was up to be repainted. So we've had that done in, in this budget cycle. And uh, we've also had other people comment on Facebook. Customers talk about why don't we put something like Welcome to Frankfurt or some kind of uh, uh, something about Frankfurt on the water tank, like a lot of other communities have. Um, but, you know, it's really up to us. So what I have done is uh, I asked David about uh, about getting prices. So he got some generic estimates as far as in general that it would be from, you know, five to $10,000 uh, to get something painted on the tank. Uh, but they would be more um, specific estimates once we provided them with a, a file of, of what the logo would be. Uh, something that we have done, if I can share my screen, I'm going to try to do this. <laughs> we have um, one mock up of can you guys see that mm -hmm. is this the frankfurt distilled no that's frankfurt on tap oh, oh yeah there it is okay frankfurt on tap uh that's what it would you know something like that we could do so we have a file that we can send i also talked to brian Bourne. he said once we had files uh we could send several different files to get some estimates uh so that's the frankfurt on tap logo and then um See if I can share. Uh, I have talked with the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, that's not it. Now, what are you all seeing? The Frankfurt Chamber of Commerce logo. Okay, yeah, you seeing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, the uh, the Frankfurt dis uh, Frankfurt Kentucky distilled. Uh, I have talked with Susie, and they do have the the local Chamber of Commerce does have a community branding committee. Uh, with funds and so she said she was going to check with them and they would have to you know agree and vote on it and all that stuff to to you know go in and pay for something like that uh, or if we just you know whoever's making the decision I don't know if that's you and I don't know if that's the city if they do if they're just wanted to be something more generic like welcome to Frankfurt that's a possibility too but whatever we put together we're gonna have to um, uh, put a file put, you know, digital files together in order to send them to someone to get a more specific um, estimate on how much that would cost. So um, we have a lot of options. And uh, again, this is just for informational purposes. If you have any questions, uh, we can, you know, talk, have discussion now and into the future. Uh, it's not anything that, you know, has to have action taken immediately. It's mm -hmm. just something that uh, some of our customers has, have asked about, something that we have thought about in the past. And now that we just have a freshly painted tank, uh, might be a good time to think if it's something that we want to do or not. So that's the information I have. If we were going to pursue this, I'm sorry, go. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I did, yeah, John. No, go on. Um, would we have to get any type of approval from the city or from anyone to paint the tank or to paint a message on the outside of the tank or, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little dicey on planning and zoning, how that stuff mm -hmm. goes. So uh, right. is that is that an issue? I don't believe it is. Again, I think it's something once we uh, would determine what um, we would want to put on there, it's definitely something that I think that we would take. Uh, to the city uh, for their guidance on how yeah. they would like to proceed. If it if we do something just for the city itself, I think it's mm -hmm. uh, something that that they would definitely want to be a part of right. and maybe help pay for. <laughs> <laughs> the, so of course they would they would need to have yeah approval on yeah. that. Uh, yeah. But I know I think Mr. Cubine has mentioned it to the mayor that it's something that we're looking at doing and. Um, 
I, I thought maybe after any kind of discussion tonight, we could move a little further down the road. Again, this is, it's not an action item for tonight, just something up for discussion. And so From a, what would you, what would your next step be if we were pursuing this for the, the board, would we f have formally contact the mayor, the city, uh, the chamber and say, or would we have like, I don't know if you'd have a public hearing, but basically have some type of process for public comments on it. How would, how would, what would be an idea of how we might structure this? If we even want to go, for, just even gauge if we want to go forward. Okay. Well, uh, again, we can, um, we can do like a, a survey. If we want to put something on our website, if something, if people are interested in uh, giving input, it's something that we can talk about uh, on, on around 10. If people have input about something they'd like to see, something we can put on our social media. Uh, if you would like input, those are just, that's how you know we gather input from our customers. Uh, again, I think, I think once we do have input, really, I mean, it, generally it's our water tank. And if we decided we were gonna just, we were just gonna go with Frankfurt on tap, then that's a decision that's made. We get the estimate, we take it to the city and um, just make sure they're good with it and proceed. If we want to put something else on it, then, um, then again, that's, you know, getting input from, from our customers or from, yeah. from our city commission uh, from the chamber, if, if they're going to, you know, if, if we go that route. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just, a, just a question. I mean, I, I don't want to be argumentative here, but do we need to have a, the, uh, the city commission approve if we wanted to put Frankfurt on tap? Yeah. Why would we need the city commission's approval to do that? I mean, I, again, I'm not trying to yeah, anyway, Steve, but Steve, I didn't. I didn't think we need city approval. We'll build a new reservoir. But you know where we are. So, <laughs> I understand that, but I mean, this is. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, and it's at that point that I turn it over to Hans. Hans, <laughs> 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 I mean, I was thinking more just in terms of a goodwill gesture and basic. No, I, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. conversations. Seems to be going down like it's it's an official, and I don't see that from my vantage point that that's that's necessary. I mean, yeah. For, well, from where I stand, if we're going to do something that uh, is just for the city itself and not anything Frankfurt on Tap or Frankfurt Plant Board, that we wouldn't want to bring them in because we would like them to contribute. To so we want them to buy cost. in, buy into it, and, and stuff. Yeah. I I totally sure. agree with that. I'm not a, that, but. Our conversation started sounding like, yeah, we we're going to be held up until we got, you know, Frankfurt on tap. It seems to me we could do it tomorrow if we approved it tonight. But I, I agree. That, but yeah. I'm not an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Hans, what do you think? The only thing I could think of is something along the lines of a billboard rule or a. Mm. Yeah, so I've not done any something along that, but but I, I like the approach of it, it's a buy-in. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it seems like it seems like it's the thing everybody would think is a great a great thing to me. I mean, the the logos look really good. I think it promotes the city well, so I wouldn't think there would be a be a problem. You know, when Kathy approaches the city to say, "Is this something everybody everybody likes?" and then there you go. So what would this? If with this is an informational item, so we're not taking any formal action, would everybody be okay with uh, reaching out to the city and Kathy doing the things she's talked about on social media, website, and that, saying this is something we're considering. If we go, if we go forward, uh, here's some ideas. Uh, anybody else have any ideas? And then come back in March with uh, hopefully, uh, if we have some indication from the city um about their uh, their position on it do they have some thoughts formally i think you said susie was uh burgess was gonna check and see if they had an interest and so forth bring that information back uh -huh. and in the meantime that gives hands the opportunity to talk with laura ross and confirm if this somehow i know the city did adopt uh some ordinances regarding um uh, uh graphic you know about uh artwork and that yeah. murals and that mm -hmm. and make sure that all that's in thing and then like you said, get the idea if there's interest in it, if anybody comes forward with some strong opposition or some new ideas about 
what it might look like that we hadn't thought about. And then we can kind of, like I said, we can talk about it in March. And if we need more information, we don't have to do this at all. And we certainly aren't in a rush. Nobody's going to be up there painting in March anyway. So right. we've got plenty of time. Yeah. Can I, let me throw this out. Yeah. If it makes any sense. One, I, I, I'd like to keep some of the control with us. So mm -hmm. if we, if we, uh, if we, perhaps establish a, an order of, of preference of a sign. Let's say our preference, which I, I would tend to agree with, the city, if the city had something that they wanted to put on there that represented Franklin, that would be the top priority. Mm -hmm. You know, then if the customer input, something that'd be the second prep. Third, we just decide Franklin on tap or some FPB logo. I'd rather establish some kind of pre-ranking of how we would do it. That way we still control how things go on, on on it. And if the city had an elaborate sign, then I would agree with Kathy that I won't call Kathy, but they would chip in a little bit too on, on the sign if it's an elaborate. But I, in my opinion, I think the city would have the first preference of uh, something on it, you know, and then so on and so on, because if we don't if we don't put some kind of preference on it, then we're gonna still come back to us with maybe city having a, uh, some mm -hmm. options, customer input options. We have option now, we're all sitting around. Yeah. You know. I think about you know, putting something on social media where people can make comments mm -hmm. about yeah. what can go on there. Um <laughs> Curious feedback only. I don't know uh, we cannot uh we cannot take any formal action tonight yeah, because I know. it's not an action item. Yeah. So it's just but uh, and then we can also look into the option of uh yeah, you know, it's a big tank. You can put something on each side. Mm -hmm. So make it a commercial billboard, like you said the first. <laughs> one, of those big, one of those big electronic boards that changes the message all the time. <laughs> I can't I I can't I can tell you this. We actually have the federal judge who's actually validated our Kentucky's billboard statute. So the legislature's in the process of trying to fix that right now. And even under the proposed law, this wouldn't be a billboard because we're not renting it out to people and putting their sign on it for money. Okay. That's 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 I the proposal. We had the expert here today. Uh, don't want some things. <laughs> <laughs> so but I, can, a... I can talk to Hans about that anytime he wants to. So. <laughs> Uh, as far as moving forward, is everybody okay with Kathy uh, reaching out, gathering some more information, uh, formal contact with the city uh, chamber, uh, getting some more information, some public comments, and then bringing it back to the board in March for an update? Is that okay? I'm good. We don't have to have a motion just for her to continue to do the staff work on it? So, okay. And then you might add in there, Kathy, to put together kind of a um, – some criteria that we might use, like Steve discussed, some draft criteria sure. that we can consider. Okay, I can do that. Okay, uh, last item, uh, 9.3, uh, is uh, we had sent this out, and I'll apologize, it's it's my fault. Uh, several weeks ago, uh, I'll admit I watched the TV show on, on PBS on KET on Saturday's Motor Week, and they had a segment on lawnmowers uh, being uh, one of the lawnmowers and other gas things being high pollution and wasted gas. And that a uh, particular city they were looking at did some type of rebate program um, for those um, to encourage people to buy electric. And then um, Gary brought up, you know, water heaters are obviously a big source of, um, of usage of fossil fuels. And that might be an area. And then uh, David Denton had sent out some information for the other discussion we have on uh, liability insurance about one of the possible areas we could use to fund it that wouldn't involve ratepayer funds would be surplus uh, surplus property sales, salvage sales. And obviously we're not, you know, KU and them in the past have done programs on, uh, you know, furnaces, uh, refrigerators, stoves and so forth. Obviously, we've got limited funds, and I guess the question here is, just for a discussion, do we want to go down this route and explore it further, uh, knowing that we'd be limited funds and not want to set up a huge bureaucracy, or do we want to go down this path? So kind of throw it open for discussion. Hmm. 
Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I got to tell you, when, when we first started talking about the, the lawn equipment stuff and the, the air pollution, I, you know, I felt like it was getting away from what we're trying to do. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're a utility. I mean, we're not, right. we're, we're concerned about the environment. We're concerned about air pollution, but that, to me, that's something more that, that a, that, that if the city government wanted to do it, that would be something the city government mm -hmm. could do to take on. Um, you know, I, I think it's an admirable, you know, it's an admirable goal, but, you know, I think most of the new appliances out there are already energy saving. And if you, right. you know, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't going to, you know, we're not going to be able to give enough in a rebate to where, you know, somebody, you know, if we give a 25 or a $50 rebate, that's not going to throw a lot of people into buying a new refrigerator or something like that. A lot of times people are going to buy new refrigerators either when they A, remodel their kitchen or when the old one goes out. I mean, it's, hmm. you know, it's, it's not a, it's not an impulse buy on a lot of this kind of stuff. I just, I just feel like it gets away from, from what we're doing as at, at, at the core of what we do. And I just, I, I just, I don't see a whole lot of, I think it would be so limited and it would take up a lot of our time trying to track stuff and all those kind of stuff. I think you can just get lost in the weeds on it. I think it's an admirable idea, but I just don't think there's a, I don't still think there's a lot there for us. That's just my, my sure. initial thought. Okay. Uh, Steve, Don, Catherine. Um, I, I think it gets into what Steve has talked about earlier and with the same thing we've dis discussed with the energy audits is it tends more towards higher income people. Mm -hmm. and, and so our lesser income rate payers probably wouldn't have the same opportunity to take advantage of it as higher income rate payers. Okay. Steve? I agree with everything that's been said. So I'll, I'll okay. Go on there. <laughs> Catherine? Um, I too agree. I, I think some really good points have been brought up um, about this this meeting. Um, uh, you know, the bottom line, if we were just looking at the electric lawnmower, is mm -hmm. over the lifespan, um, you're going to save money. So there's right. already an incentive. Um, and and I do agree with John as far as is it worth staff time on this project that a lot of people probably won't take advantage of. And Don's point, only certain people are going to be able to take advantage of it. Um, so maybe um, we could just, you know, do some kind of public service kind of things on Facebook about, about it. Um, I mean, I don't think a lot of people know how much pollution, for instance, a gas mm -hmm. lawnmower causes um, that over the lifespan, even though an electric lawnmower up front costs more, you know, there's charts I've seen like that. Maybe um, just to kind of scratch that itch <laughs> that I think mm -hmm. some of us have on this topic that we could just approach it from a, a education standpoint. Okay. So seeing seeing un, seeing underwhelming interest in this item, <laughs> I think I think we've had a, a robust discussion, and I think we can uh, Kathy can maybe pursue looking at the uh, public education aspects, and then nine point three doesn't need to be on the agenda again. <laughs> so uh, next item is permission to have the, a closed session. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd yes. like to make a motion. We move to closed session for sixty one eight ten one C. Discuss pending litigation regarding subcontractor lien claim and TRS 161810-1M, which is a new one, to discuss specific records exempted from disclosure by TRS 61878-1M. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We're going into closed session. Okay, we're back on. Um, we're out of closed session. No actions taken. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Do we have a second? Second. S any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.